va avoir une discussion avec Jérémy Rifkin et deux intervenants issus de deux mondes différents. Euh, L'une, vous allez voir, vient vraiment du monde euh, du business et l'autre euh, est le, le patron des patrons. So I'm going to switch to English uh, to introduce uh, our panelists. So Mr. Rifkin is going to come back. Alongside him, we have Sophie Bloom. Sophie is the former, um, I, I need to be a bit precise, but former vice president global brand innovation at Brand Building Europe at Procter Gamble. I say she's the former head of innovation at Procter Gamble Europe. And now she joined ICOR. Uh, maybe you've heard it's an investment fund that has been started by Maurice Levy, uh, founder uh, of uh, uh, chairman of Publicis, uh, and that was announced last month. And our last speaker is Blaise Maté. You know Blaise Maté is the director general of the Fédération des entreprises romandes. So in French, we say it's the patron des patrons. And uh, he has a great overview of what's happening in our businesses. So please welcome our panelists, Sophie Bloom, Blaise Maté, and Jeremy Rifkin. Alors, on me fait signe qu'il va falloir... Je vais devoir... Mr. Rifkin va venir dans un second, mais il n'était pas prévu de parler first parce que Sophie, vous êtes la première. S'il vous plaît, avez un siège. Blaise, avez un siège. Donc, pendant que Mr. Rifkin est prêt, Sophie, vous avez entendu cette présentation. Très... L'un des plus longs rounds d'applaudissements de l'audience. Je pense que c'était très... Beaucoup de gens pouvaient relater à ce qu'il a dit. Quel est votre feedback Quel est votre réaction après ce que Mr. Rifkin a dit Look, I'm, uh, I'm a huge fan, so it's a bit biased as a way to, uh, as a way to uh, uh, answer. But uh, my reaction is um, um, how, uh, how you can just take what he said and uh, uh, just step back and think through what was the concrete pragmatic business experience I had which can really associate with what he said. And I think the one that you will smile, I'm going to quote, is uh, the uh, innovation uh, hub I created in Israel already 10 years ago. Because when, when uh, Jeremy talks about uh, uh, lateral versus vertical, which was our very first conversation, uh, I think this is my biggest takeaway from what he said, but also from my personal business experience. I think that I've, I've had the privilege to work across the world, across categories in the consumer goods. Now I'm in tech, deep tech, and data. And in fact, what I take away is nobody can win alone. And for a big corp like the one I belong to, like PNG, it's a hell of a statement. And, uh, and, and why nobody can win alone? Simply because of what he explained. Now I can put words and concept behind it. But a um, very concrete example, uh, when I was uh, building the business in Israel for PNG, um, Israel is pretty small, like Switzerland, so globally, very focused on innovation. And I very fast figured out that this would be a very huge added value for PNG in terms of uh, disruption, disruption and innovation. However, PNG was still organized per silo, vertical silos of function and business unit. And in fact, what I came to experiment, which is lateral, lateral uh, application of innovation, is the way to disrupt is to go across, across marketing, across uh, supply chain, across manufacturing, in order to produce something in a faster time, lower cost, and answering consumer needs much better. Oral B Power Brush that you all know, for example, has been created, the first IoT device, the first device, consumer good device to bring IoT to, uh, I would say, the consumer good industry, uh, is, uh, is built, has been built thanks to open ecosystem uh, in, in a time that was uh, five times faster than any other things we could have done. Mr. Rifkin is joining us back. Welcome back. Thank you. You can welcome him again. Thank you. You can join us, have a seat. Oh. I'm too old for stools. <laughs> My wife and I have big arguments when we go into bars. I cannot do them anymore. All right. We'll, well find you'll a way. see someday. All right. So, Jeremy, I was, the, the panel starts with these, the, the, the two speakers reacting to what you were saying, and Sophie was relating, was using her experience uh, for PNG in Israel, saying that she could really relate to what you say about thinking laterally to bring innovation and that uh, organizations are structured in silos and that's, that's inadequate uh, in the world we live in. Blaise, you are, you are heading an organization that um, has thousands of members 
from SMEs to large companies. What was your reaction to Mr. Rifkin's talk? First of all, I'm extremely happy to meet Jeremy Rifkin today because I've been following him for years. I mean, you wrote a lot of books about the end of work, for instance. Oh, yeah. long time. A long time ago, and we're still working, and all these young people here are going to work in the future, as you said. So um, my, my reaction is basically positive. And that is, uh, for a, a reason that is very personal, I wrote my book, the only book I wrote, actually, 35 years ago, on renewable energies, oh. solar energy, geothermy, wind energy. And all what you say about this is absolutely correct. But one thing is amazing me. When I started my work at that time, I was the only one in the world to write on that. I brought some stuff from the US. And at that time, remember, President Carter was, was at the top of the United States. And then came Ronald Reagan. That was when I was writing, doing my research and writing my book. And all of a sudden, all the, the information that we had in the US stopped to come to Europe. And I had to ship the books at that time. There was no Amazon at that time, you know. We had to bring them, and it took us months before we could get them. So the US at that time were very much ahead of all what we're talking about. And when I, when I got all this stuff, I'm, I was just thinking, is that really true? Can we change our society, our economy? But when I mean society, it includes economy, of course, towards a less uh, oil consumption-oriented society or not. And I was, I must say, pretty skeptical about that. I said, well, maybe for 5 or 10% of our energy consumption for the future. Now you say, you explain, that we will go to zero oil consumption in the future. So that's why I'm very, very much amazed by what you say. I would like to believe you, but you have to convince me a little bit more, if I may say. We are suffering from the imports of German energy. And these are basically coal energy, not solar and wind energy. And it brings down our own companies in Switzerland, which are hydroelectric companies. This is renewable energy. This is the energy. We're going to also uh, store water, which is very important for the future. So that's one of the issues I wanted to raise because, you know, it's deep in me, and I've been following this for years. I was an environmental lawyer for a couple of years, and I, I, I still understand and follow all these matters. So that was one of my reactions. Second reaction, you're saying more or less the same as Steven Pinker as in the last book says. We have to go back to enlightenment. I mean, we have a future ahead of us. But now if we look at politics in the US, many countries in Europe, think about Hungary, think about Holland, think about Switzerland, you see that we're going backwards in the way we think. We don't believe in globalization anymore. You say there is a new globalization. Uh, could you maybe more explain what you think about that? Because we have to convince the new generation not to close the borders, but to go ahead further in a good direction which is a green direction. And that's something, really, um, that I, I care a lot about. So this was my second reaction. How do we deal with politics nowadays? That was a long time ago, 30, 35 years ago on solar. Um, you might Started early. <laughs> one of my close friends who's in our global team is Michael Totten. He put the solar panels on the White House for Jimmy Carter. Yeah, so we're all getting older. But he, and then Reagan took them off. <laughs> you know, very enlightened. The, uh, let me talk a little bit about um, why I think this is moving really quickly in the business community. We can thank the EU, and we can thank the EU for doing something that has changed the equation in the marketplace. We spent a number of years during the Romano Prati and the Barroso regime and, and before Juncker, and you remember, we set up a target of 20%, 20%, 20% mandated that every country in Europe had to reduce their global warming emissions by 20%, increase their energy efficiency by 20%, and increase their solar and wind by 20% by 2020. That was legally mandated. We have reached the goals already. We're already there. We passed the goals for 2020. Now for 2030, it's way up. Why is this up, and why is the world going to thank the EU? 
Originally, when we went to the renewables, we had to put in feed-in tariffs to give premium price above market, below, above market price to stimulate early adopters to take on solar and wind in those co-ops, because they were getting more money than the market would give them. It put some strain on, on, uh, on consumers, because their prices went up for their electricity, but we were able to get out of those tariffs in and out in less than 10 years. We don't need them anymore. We're at parity. We're below parity with coal. We're at parity with solar and wind in many places and below, and we're on an exponential curve. They're not. And so there have been a lot of studies done now internal to the energy industry across the board in the banking and insurance company in the last year, which you should take a look at. They're really interesting. And what we're saying is the market has now spoken. So it really makes no difference if governments assume the mandate of Paris or not. The market has now dictated this massive transition out of fossil fuels. It's going to come really, really quick now. And what we found in Europe is when you reach 14 percent renewables, just 14, that's the inflection point where fossil fuels on the energy grid are now growing at a slower rate. The moment they start growing at a slower rate, the investment community, that's when they wake up. So even if you have only 14 percent of the market, that's the inflection point. We saw that with the uh, internet. That's the inflection point across, across every industry. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm moderately, guardedly hopeful we can do this. But it isn't just the price, then you have to organize. And this is where uh, uh, I think is important for everyone to hear. We have something in Europe called the subsidiarity principle. How many know what that, have heard of the subsidiarity principle? It's the heart of the European Constitution. How many have ever heard of it? Yeah. Well, it's quite interesting. Well, Switzerland was way ahead with the cantons. I mean, so you should have no excuse. You should be leading at this point. So it built into the Club of Rome Treaty is that all power, political power, by law, has to start at the local and regional level. That's the subsidiary principle, that anything that's not that you need beyond that level, you don't move up. You move out in concentric circles, like Gandhi's governing concentric circles. So everything starts at the local level. Then whatever you need beyond that, you move with the nation state and the EU. In theory, that's been there. In practice, it is not. However, you, you may not know this in Switzerland, but every EU member state has to, the, the government, the national governments have to give a certain amount of their tax revenue to the EU, which is then given back to all the regions. Not necessarily from that state. They give it back to the regions that need it anywhere. Then the regions can use that. It's a huge amount of money. But many times the nation states thwart the regions from using it in all sorts of ways, and then it goes back to the nation state if it's not used. So we now have a major turn going in Europe, across the political parties and across the regions and in the business community, saying, look, this third industrial revolution is tailor-made for localities to set up their own roadmaps, use the architecture, get the monies, not only leverage from the EU, but investment funds, pension funds, uh, private equity, and move this out. It's not about the money. It's about organizing a 20, 30-year construction site in each canton that can then have companies bid to lay out whole infrastructure. It's not the money. Sorry, and the last thing I'd say about just one last moment on this, and that is that this is the way you defeat extreme populism. People have, are justifiable in one sense as saying the elites are not listening to us at the national level or EU level or global level. People are cynical, they're upset, they're disappointed. What we learned in northern industrial France is when people take charge of their own region, they think less about who's doing what to them because they've rolled up their sleeves and creating their own economic mm -hmm. destiny. That's what we need to do across the world. I want, I want to go deeper, and I want to actually reconnect Blaise's uh, question. Um, and I think all of you can relate to that. So uh, yesterday evening at dinner with someone who runs a very large sports organization and someone who runs a very large NGO. And we're discussing how, in some ways, it's much easier to operate in Asia because it's a top-down system in many countries, you know, to say it in a, in a polite way. Um, and we run on these very messy, very slow democracies. And I, I, I relate to my wife, who grew up in South Korea in the 90s, and she told me one day the government decided that the citizens would be recycling, and the next morning, everybody was recycling. And then she moved to Paris, and she, it's not really how you do things in Paris, right? <laughs> And so uh, my question is, like, for the sake of corporate innovation or political systems, all these big shifts that we need to do, 
what is the most adequate system and what, what do we have to learn from these countries that operate in a different way and that sometimes as democracy we tend to look down on. And you know, it seems they're managing some things really much better than us on some aspects. Maybe Sophie, if you, you've been traveling a lot around the world, you, you've seen a lot of cultures. Like for you, if I move away the political side of it, but the, the business, <laughs> the innovation <laughs> side, yeah. um, uh, what do you think? What is the most adequate system? I think what you are referring to is uh, actually, uh, I would say, um, all about leadership. I mean, I think that the way you define uh, leadership uh, within companies or, or within society is very linked to how do you deal with uh, uh, producing the output. And I think that where, where it's difficult, what, what I have experienced over the last few years is, I, I would say, three main transformation of leadership that are coming from various, uh, and have insight and rooted insight from various cultures, but one is about, uh, you were talking about uh, top-down, uh, in, 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 in many, many ways, uh, empowerment is uh, uh, a very productive answer to uh, speed and disruptive innovation. And, and, and this is a challenge because, I'm, I mean, be it in big corps or small startup, how do you get the expected outcome uh, in a very, very short term, I would say lead time, with a higher standard of quality, uh, when you need to embark with you a few hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, and I think um, personal empowerment, at least from my experience, is uh, extremely hard, but is extremely powerful to deliver, I would say, the results. Uh, the second one that, uh, that uh, I would say is coming also from the ob observation in, in, um, in business is uh, the ability to, uh, I would say, perform integrative leadership. Because when, when you are at school or you join a company or you build a project like the startup we just saw, I mean, yes, of course, we can tell you, I just told you that I believe that in innovation, what was a real breakthrough was to uh, cross all the silos and think laterally versus vertically integrated. Now, you could ask me the question, what the hell? I mean, how am I going to explain that to my boss or to my teacher? or to my discipline leader, whatever. And, and I think that integrative leadership, uh, both across discipline and internally or externally vis-a-vis -vis the organization you are in, is the second challenge. The third one to conclude for me, the most um, also inspiring one, is about really ambidextry, um, ambidextrous leadership. And, and in a way, it's how... Um, you can live and deliver on the expectation of your school, organization, business, investor, boss, uh, institution is asking from you, while at the same time being pretty at ease with the ambiguity of the, what the future and the disruption is, I would say, drawing for you. And, and those three areas of uh, integrative leadership, ambidextrous leadership, and um, empowerment and, and self-empowerment are mm. probably the one I have experienced. Like this, this idea that you need to build for resilience rather than robustness in the world yes. we live in. Jeremy, do you want to rebound on this? Or Blaise? No, no, no. Okay, Jeremy. Uh, I can give you a little bit of my experience in China. Uh, very complex civilization. Uh, There's kind of a myopic view in the West that there's 10 guys that are running the country. Uh, I know some of them. Uh, there are not 10 people running the country. It's a very complex society, and the, the, you have the Standing Committee, you have the Politburo, you have the, 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 the Congress, you have a huge amount of state companies, then you have private companies, and the regions are totally competitive. Every region is in a total competitive race with every other region. And um, in the, the new uh, China, the government actually uh, likes to stimulate local regions and local governance and local business to innovate because then they see the models that will work. They're not fools. They know that they can't just dictate something in their mind and hope it'll happen in practice. So there is a huge uh, incentive for local regions to be innovative and then the best practices can then be borrowed by other regions as they so choose. So it, it's also complicated because you have state companies versus private companies in China. It's very complicated. But I will say this. My own personal experience is that 
where this, you know, a, a revolution of this magnitude that's distributed and laterally scaled and transparent and open, it has to resonate in the same way you build it out and you orchestrate it, which is why I believe regions will be the empowering agent in this. As we move toward globalization, we will see regions being able, they already are, it's not just Catalonia and Scotland and Quebec and California. Every region in the world I know is globalizing, setting up their own embassies. They're involved in all sorts of trade agreements and, and in all sorts of commercial agreements and financial agreements. This is going on under the radar, but it's so widespread now, we just keep talking about globalization, where globalization is the new competing order. And the digital technologies are what's allowing it because we can move to low fixed cost and marginal cost to engage in virtual time and real time in social and business life 24 seven anywhere in the world. So it's a massive lateralization, if you will, what we call peer assembly, peer democracy, both in the business community and local regions. Mm -hmm. Nation states will not disappear, but they will increasingly play the role of creating codes, regulations, standards, and incentives but economic development in the 21st century is gonna be in localities and regions connecting with each other across continents and around the world. That I'm sure of. Yeah, one of the most uh, emerging force right now is this group of the 40 top cities in the world. I don't remember the name, but uh, it's becoming a, a very massive political voice. Blaise, you work with a lot of uh, international bodies. Uh, for example, yeah. the ILO, where you think about the future of work. What, what's your yeah, we think about it. We don't know what the future of work is exactly. I mean, I've been attending many panels, I've presided many of them over the last years, and when we're talking about the future of work, we don't know exactly what it is. Honestly said, and you have to be honest to say, yes, you, you might be right, and, and I hope you will be right in the transformation that is ahead of us, but we're not so sure. Are we gonna have jobs for everybody? Yes, you said, there is a, an opportunity if we invest properly in the future. I follow you. But we, you have to be aware of the fact that the people that are now out of the labor market might not follow this path and will not be able to do so. So I have my doubts about that for the future of work, but I wish we find a solution and we'll have to be inclusive. I was never a supporter of the idea that freedom is selfish. Freedom has not to be selfish. You know that idea did not exist, in my opinion, you might disagree with me, until the break of the Berlin Wall. For me, the shift was the break of the Berlin Wall. Before that, we were all aware of the fact that we had the communist system just besides us. They were spying on us all the time. I was in the military at that time, and I remember the Russian cars, the Hungarian cars, following us to get the information. That was what was happening 30 years ago. One generation, maybe a little bit more. So, you see, uh, when we're talking about freedom, I think that this is a new concept that came recently out of some business people and intellectual. No, freedom means that you have to care also about the others around you. A group, and you know that, Sophie, very well, will always defeat an individual. You have to remember this. Now, we can, we can talk about the scale of the group. Is it, as you said, a nation which is vanishing? Is it a region? Is it a neighborhood? I don't know. The only thing I know is that you should always care about that. Think about the people besides you and what the impact of your action is going to be. And also, tell the other what the impact of his or her action might be on you. And if we agree on this, and that's creating the human grade, as I call it, then we have a solution towards new values that can bring our society to a different stage in the future. Let me say, I, I agree with you about this concept of freedom. In some ways, it's um, the notion of freedom that I describe is very much an American notion, a libertarian notion. We have a very strong libertarian tradition, which is freedom is exclusivity, uh, don't tread on me is, uh, is the flag of the revolution. There's a lot of that mentality. Europe is more a social market economy. Uh, now, on the other hand, what I'm seeing is a younger, and let me preface this. That libertarian notion, I'm gonna say, took off from America to Europe and the world with a neoliberal agenda starting in the 1980s. Thatcher, Reagan, all the way to um, Blair, Bush, everybody, uh, Obama, uh, who I love, but 
uh, the neoliberal agenda was really more libertarian in its basis and, and more everybody, if they are allowed to be entrepreneurial, uh, their individual interests, while it's only their interests, will equal the common good. They went back to Adam Smith, but in a very libertarian way. But there is a whole tradition in Europe post-World War II of social market economy, never again. Freedom is sharing, freedom is we're responsible for each other. Freedom is I can't be free unless you're free. That is a big tradition that started after World War II in Germany with Willy Brandt and Switzerland across the continent. I agree with you on that. Uh, in terms of the labor market, my own read is, uh, I, I agree with you, it's about whether we can provide the right kind of education that can get to everybody for the types of employment that'll be available. Completely agree. I'm convinced we have plenty of semi-skilled, skilled, and professional jobs to lay out this infrastructure. I'm also convinced that when it's laid out, it's gonna be run by algorithm governance to a good extent in small workforces. What we're seeing is the trend is moving toward the nonprofit and social economy. It's by far the fastest growing employer. In my country, it's 10% of the employment, 15% in California, Europe, it's about 13%. And these are jobs that require social capital and machines are only secondary. We, our love affair with technology, I think, will hit the wall in education, healthcare, environment, many fields where we'll realize it can play a role but basically it's gonna be human beings in many of those fields. Uh, so, but then the question is, how do we re-look at our educational system so it's preparing young people both for the digital skills of this infrastructure build out in two generations, but on the same track, prepare young people for social capital, the nonprofit, the social economy, which requires a completely different approach. You need both. And if we can't do that through the educational reforms, then I agree, we're stuck. I have just one additional question, which uh, deals with that, that question of profit and investment, and also with taxes. Uh, I, I followed you several times, and there, there is something, in my opinion, of, of a lack of explanation about that. We are making profit on oil these days, and we should reinvest the profit on renewable energies, on saving our environment in the future. Am I correct when I listen to you? Yes. So, uh, uh, do you imagine the future of the tax system, the future of the public spending, uh, when we think that we have to invest so much in our future? Uh, you were talking about new grids, but new grids are also new railways, for instance. And we know that in the US, for instance, there have been plans about that, but they haven't been completed yet. So, who's going to pay for that? Do we, do we think that the uh, nonprofit organization will have a sufficient profit or sufficient donations to finance this, or is it going to come from somebody or somewhere else? So, Jeremy, the question is challenging. I'm going to make it even more challenging because we have been keeping these people away from lunch. We are a bit late. So, you, you, I give you two minutes to re answer that. One so you can finish, too. Exactly. And, okay. and, then, and then I'm going to ask all of you for a closing statement. But I'm So, about the tax system. Well, I, I think that um, the money is there. For example, we had this debate in the EU back in 2013, 12, 2012, where's the money? And I said, well, we have the money. The problem is where we're spending it. So we spend in a recession year maybe $700 billion in infrastructure in Europe. And, the, and during the recession, we were doing that. The problem is we're spending it on the old infrastructure that had peaked in its productivity and its generativity. So I said, if you took even part of that $700 billion a year and you put it into the new infrastructure, we'd be there in 10 or 15 years. So we're putting a lot of money to an old infrastructure that's, not, that's shown that it's worn out, can't give us the productivity. I think also we're gonna see more and more private equity and, and uh, sovereign funds and pension funds and others seeing to move to the new energies because the price is there, absolutely. The market is really dictating this at this time. Fossil fuels are becoming stranded. Uh, the market's moving to green in a really fast way. So I'm guardedly hopeful, but then there's this whole thing about transients and people being not alert and not moving quick enough, and I understand that. So to finish, I mean, we are at close, uh, a crossroads. It's gonna go get better or it's gonna get worse. You gave us a very extensive roadmap of things that we need to pay attention to, things we can do. Both students that we had on stage this morning talking about the project, ask them what would you recommend? Say like, just get walking, start moving. So. How to, let, let's, to close, make this big roadmap concrete. Like, what is one thing that all the people in the room can do 
tomorrow to you know, steer us more towards the positive outcome that we have. If, Sophie, do you have a concrete step? A concrete step for me is uh, as simple as uh, get around the table with uh, the students you work with, the colleagues, uh, the business partners, in order to concretely solve and address a small piece of the total uh, mm. issue you work on. Be as concrete as possible, as I've tried to be as concrete as possible, as close with something that is very close to you and talks to you, because it seems extremely big, uh, yeah, and, discouraging, and, it? and it's a bit, yeah, you feel a bit helpless, like, uh, wow, I'm going to do that, me? And in fact, what I've learned is, bits by p the, the biggest challenge is to decompose the issue into small pieces, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden, it's like, you know, a, a good old to-do list, okay? Uh, it's, it's all of a sudden, you, you can create small, agile team focused on one small piece, mm -hmm. and then we solve it all. So your advice is... Get together and focus on one problem, a small problem, a problem we care about. Blaise, your advice, and then Jeremiah. N my advice is very simple al also. Remain optimistic. We're not facing nice times ahead, but we didn't have any nice times in the past. Remain optimistic, and why so this morning was very, a very optimistic crowd, and, and I liked us very much. If you complain all the time, what are the kind of solutions that you're going to bring? There will be no solutions. So be optimistic, trust yourself, trust the authorities, trust your neighbor. Yes, trust. Trust is a massive challenge this day. But I can assure you that most people can be and have to be trusted. Thank you, Blaise. Jeremiah? We have 1,500 people in this room. We have social media across Switzerland. What I would suggest Find someone in this room and a group of people in this room that are willing to bring everyone together within the startup digital community and the universities across Switzerland and create a movement for this transition to a third industrial revolution. That is all the startups, all the digital startups and the universities across all three regions. We need Geneva, we need Zurich, we need Lugano. We need all three regions. And if you can begin to move this narrative forward, you could do this in a few months. There are other places that have done this. If you can bring together all the digital startups and all the universities, you can do this in a few months, create kind of a manifesto or a declaration saying it's time to transform all of Switzerland into this green third industrial revolution and be a model for Europe, post-carbon, 10, 15 years. That's what the young people in the new Congress in the U.S. are talking about now. You can do this tomorrow morning, along with your day-to-day -day job. And it's, this will move Switzerland. We need to be optimistic. You helped us do just that. Thank you very much, the three of you. Big round of applause.